Well, let me welcome all of you to chat with Matt. Uh, my goal with chat with Matt is to find people who have something important to say that I think you'll find useful to your careers. Uh, we have with us uh, today, Nancy uh, Ankowitz. Uh, hopefully I got that right, because we I rehearsed that a little bit. Um, she's gonna be talking about uh, career visibility for introverts. My practice has been that uh, I allow, I ask my guest speakers to uh, pretty much introduce themselves uh, because uh, anytime I've been introduced, the person doing it has totally made me cringe and set me off my game. So <laughs> I, I lean towards letting my guest speakers do that. Uh, just so you know, Nancy is a published author. Uh, her book is available on her website. And uh, if you type into your uh, browser, selfpromotionforintroverts.com, you will uh, get her blog, uh, which I'm sure is somehow linked to her book and uh, something that you can uh, purchase. Uh, so with no further ado, I'm gonna uh, turn this over to Nancy to begin the discussion. A little bit about, hopefully she'll give us a little bit about her background and how she came to where she is today because career experiences are always an important part of our FENG discussion. Uh, and again, uh, just to remind you, there is a chat box. Uh, my wife, Peggy, is uh, on this call and she'll be monitoring the chat box and uh, uh, summarizing your comments and questions uh, for our guest speaker. We're gonna be doing probably half an hour, 45 minutes, and then we'll be moving into questions. But if something is relevant to what we're talking about, we may uh, jump in and uh, deal with it immediately. So. Nancy, I'm going to spotlight you, uh, and uh, welcome to Chat with Matt. Uh, just so you know, Nancy and I uh, know each other. Uh, she spoke at our meeting in Westport uh, several years ago, and uh, I thought uh, I've, I've watched her over the years because I'm on her distribution list. So, Nancy, welcome to Chat with Matt. Thank you, Matt, and thank you, Peggy. Delighted to be back at the Chat with Matt channel. And when you said spotlight me, and I'm thinking spotlight an introvert, ooh, <laughs> can I turn off my camera now? <laughs> so anyhow, I'm a career and presentation coach and author of Self-Promotion for Introverts, as Matt mentioned, and it's been translated in a bunch of languages. I think this is just so fun. What, what language do you think that is? I, I'm guessing Italian. Uh, this one's no? French. This one's French. Oh, French, of course. This one. I barely speak English, Nancy. So <laughs> forgive me. Any idea? Uh, I I wouldn't even begin to guess. Korean. 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 Wow. And here we go. This one you'll probably get. Yeah. Is that the Italian one? That's Italian. There's okay. also Russian, but I don't I have that one, one with them. me. But, but there was a funny story about, well, I don't know if it's funny, when there were some Russian spies and they were caught, I guess by the FBI, and on their way out the window or however they exited, they left a copy of some famous American book and a copy of my book, Self-Promotion for Introverts. Oh, really? <laughs> So it was in the Daily News, however many years ago. I thought it's kind of the roadmap to how to succeed as an introvert in the United States. <laughs> Duh. <laughs> so anyhow, I here would we guess go. spies aren't too talkative. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yes. So I spent 12 years on Wall Street. I was a vice president of marketing at JP Morgan Chase. Before that, I was in Citibank. And I was a total workaholic. And I hired an executive coach to help me figure out, I couldn't imagine staying on Wall Street the rest of my career. It was just, I, I mean, I had a fantastic job, best boss of my career nice team reporting to me. I had all the good trappings, but I still couldn't imagine staying there forever. So I hired this executive coach and she held up the mirror for me in essence and said, you are burnt out. And she said, she suggested that I take a career break, like a, a leave of absence, a, a sabbatical, what have you. And I said, no, I've got clients. I've got deliverables. I have deadlines, leave me alone. But 
in our conversations, I started to actually listen to what she was saying. And in reflecting, I realized I really did need that break. So discussed it with my boss, said I would work double, triple time, whatever it was, to make it as easy as possible for her. I always believe with your bosses, you want to make it as easy as possible for them. And I did. Yes. I got to take three months off. It turned into six to nine to 12. And then I had a decision to make. I decided to leave to pursue a dream, which was one, I wanted to write a book. And when I learned, I, was, I learned I was an introvert through the Myers-Briggs type indicator, popular, super popular personality assessment. Mm -hmm. I took that on Wall Street and it gave, it opened my eyes up to who I really am. It made sense. I always knew I tend to be more quiet at meetings. I always knew I like to listen a lot before I speak. I always knew I'm more comfortable with one-on-one -on -one conversations than being in massive networking meetings where just lots of people and lots of noise and lots of inputs, too much for me. So I knew these things about me, but learning that I had this identification and it's not a label and there's no test, there are tests, but the Myers-Briggs is not one. It's just yeah. a self-assessment. Well, one of the things I, I, I would glad you brought up the Myers-Briggs because it was uh, an eye-opening test for me in that uh, you learn that all styles work. Hmm. And the most important thing is that you understand what style you are. Yes. Yes. And you understand your style. And it's not only introvert, extrovert, but that's what I'm focusing on right now. And I realized I had learned so much as an introvert on Wall Street. And before that, way back when I was a jewelry designer, and now I run my own business again as a career coach and I teach at NYU. I wear a lot of hats. Mm -hmm. Anyhow, I realized what I wanted was my executive coach's job. Not hers particular, but I wanted to start my own way, my own path, helping other people doing some of my favorite things, which is listening, strategizing, mm -hmm. taking mm -hmm. all my branding and marketing experience and helping branding and marketing them to help them advance in their careers. So I quit my Wall Street job after, on great terms, still in touch with the boss. And really now I do what I really, really love, which is that thing to help specifically introverts, many from the financial field, because that's where I spent a lot of years and some extroverts too, but help them advance in their career. So that's my background. And I also blog for psychology today and so forth. Well, it's nice to know you can also help extroverts. <laughs> of course, we're human I, beings. I have a question for you. Do you think your burnout was a result of your being an introvert? I think there's a lot to, to that, Matt, that mm -hmm. being a perfectionist, being super detail-oriented, mm -hmm. being the last one to leave the office often because I'm such a perfectionist. Yeah. I wonder how many people out there can relate to that that it's just, sure. I, I care about doing the best job always, even at personal expense. And there has to be more balance in one's life than that. I, I agree. I, I tend to get totally absorbed in everything. And one of my little jokes about what I do now is that I only work from nine to 9.30 every day, but sadly that's not a half an hour. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. I can relate to that. I can relate. I, to that. I'm into this. I'm committed to this. Yes. But if you're an introvert, the important thing is one important thing is to read. We're not talking necessarily about a shy person, mm -hmm. but somebody who recharges their energy from their quiet time or even one on one conversation but not in large group settings. Like I remember I didn't sleep for 12 years, my 12 years on Wall Street, any Sunday night because we had these 7.45 a.m. meetings every Monday morning. And my mind was busy thinking about the meetings and what I would say and this and that. And it's just too much. So learning to strike that balance is so important. How are you gonna recharge your energy and where will you find that quiet time? And even building in and scheduling little breaks between meetings, between webinars, what have you these days with the COVID era. But it's so important to schedule those breaks. It is, sure. 
So why don't we jump in? I, 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 I love the story of your journey. Thank you. Yes, let's jump in. You have a question for me? Well, we, we should start with, uh, as an introvert, how, how you build your network. If you're shy, you know, you're hesitant to reach out to people, brag about what you do, get them to endorse you in a sense. Uh, how do you go about it? How do you go about it? It's such an important question. Think about it as an introvert rather than, again, going into crowded networking meetings back when, and I'm sure we'll, we'll get to do that again, but it's thinking of one conversation at a time. You can have a conversation with another human being and not everybody you're going to like, but find a few people you like or respect, or you find you like or respect and build relationships with them over time. Introverts are good at that. Getting to know, getting to listen, getting to share. We're good at that. And there, I like to think of four I's. So there are four, the letter I. You can sh all often share insights. You can share information like market intel if you're both looking for a job or one of you is. Mm -hmm. You can share, make introductions. And you can also give invitations. And invitations these days are easy. Send a link yeah. to the next chat with Matt. Done. Mm -hmm. Like I heard you're interested in this topic share link, chat with Matt or Ted talk, what have you, but it's showing you're interested in the other party and follow up and follow up a certain amount of time. Is this a person you would want to follow up with once a year, once every month, every quarter? And you get to do that by asking questions and getting to know them. Yeah. Well, you know, you'd think being an introvert would be very positive in terms of networking because that is really one-to-one. -one. As yes. opposed to being at a mass meeting and working the room, uh, you have this opportunity in our connected world to set up one-on-one -on -one appointments with people. Yes. Virtual coffee chats now. You sit mm -hmm. in your living room. You, you only have to be dressed up from the waist up. Look into the camera. Smile. Ah, we want to talk about smiling, Matt, don't we? Yes, go and ahead. And Peggy, who's go smiling ahead. and nodding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why do we want to talk about smiling? You know, I, no, I, I, interview, I, tease, interview. I tease Peggy that she collects life stories because when someone is talking to her, she has this winning smile that says, tell me your life story. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Well, as an introvert, you may not smile externally. You had a funny line for this, Matt, right before we went online. You want to share what it was? Uh, a, a bar mitzvah conversation by the father of the bar mitzvah. Uh, and it was, uh, it, it's a very dear friend of ours. And he's a, he's a physician, a very serious man. And he got up in front of the camera and he said, uh, thank you all for coming. As you know, I'm smiling on the inside. Those of you who know me know I'm smiling on the inside. It says it all. Yeah. It says it all. And I know, especially on video, in video meetings, video interviews, that's something you need to remember to do. And because you're only seen in this little box, yeah. your face is so much more important than if there are lots of people around you and lots of other visual cues and people could see more of your body. But if they only mainly see your face, put a smile on it. It engages others. It makes you feel, it makes you more likable. It makes you more approachable, which introverts often are not. So it's a reminder to warm up the room with a smile. Yeah, a smile lights up the room. Yep, yep. It lets the, whoever is talking know that they're connecting with you. Yes. But it, it, and on, on Zoom, it might just be something you need to be aware of. At least on Zoom, you can see yourself. You can see how you're reacting and perhaps that, that is helpful. One of the uh, 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 coaching points that I used to give people when they were doing telephone interviews was to have a mirror in front of them so they could see their own face. Ah. Now they're on Zoom, they can see their own face. How, can see how cool is face. that? Yet some people are terrified seeing their own face. 
And they're right. also terrified seeing this giant face coming back at them. <laughs> if you're looking in, what is it? There's portrait and gallery and all these various views, but sometimes that could also be intimidating. So it takes some oh, getting okay. used to. Yeah, sorry, Matt. No, I, you just brought up a very good point that maybe, uh, you know, a lot of people when they're on these uh, mass calls, they'll put their Zoom in gallery view. Perhaps for introverts, that's a little intimidating. Can be, can be. Maybe speaker yeah. view is, is something that will help you relax. As long as you check the spinach between your teeth beforehand. Ah, <laughs> good point. Right. Do a serious mirror check, yeah. <laughs> mirror or video check even get there extra extra early to do all that stuff to see if there are any flyaways or any kind of crooked if there's things. any if there's a fly sitting on your head you want to be careful oh the that. fly on the forehead yeah we'll, we'll leave it we'll leave politics out of this but we know what we mean <laughs> what we do uh we do a lot of uh, peggy does a lot of uh, stuff about the uh, zoom uh interviews and so forth and uh, checking your background and getting settled in early, I think, is important. Yes, yes, and I know you're big on being on time, Matt. I'm so right. with no, no, you. But, but being there and having an opportunity to settle in. Uh, I was always big on in-person meetings, getting there early. I always wanted the best bagels, and they, you know, they disappear immediately. <laughs> uh, but it's also uh, people just assume you were you're part of the leadership group if you get to a meeting early. They yes. just assume. And a Zoom tip is if you show up first, you show up right next to the host. So you're mm. more visible if okay. you show up early. Oh, great. Great. And, you know, we can we can talk about visibility. Yeah. We can segue right into that. Let's do that. Yeah, please. So raising your visibility as an introvert. Raising your visibility. Very How important. to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Go, go to it. We all have our strengths. We all have things we do well. And as a senior financial executive, maybe you're wonderful with numbers. Maybe you're wonderful at conducting analyses. Maybe you're wonderful at research. Maybe you're great at, at listening. Maybe you're terrific at speaking. Maybe it's writing or editing. There's gonna be some of this stuff. Identify it, be clear on it and then make what we call a marketing mix of activities that will help you raise your visibility. It's not gonna be everything. Nobody is good at everything. So if you're good at writing and editing, then send out a, do a blog or, or write a white paper or do, do updates on LinkedIn or what have you, but write or co-write with others. If you're good at more being a host, then have virtual cocktail parties or networking events or other ways of bringing people together, then you're the host, it's wonderful. It's so pick, play to your strengths and pick those activities that really where you shine. And if it's research, get to know your audience so that you could target them best. Oh, that's a good tip. And you know, that kind of feeds back into the whole networking thing. I was just thinking again about what you were saying about uh, building up your network. A lot of uh, people who are hesitant to network and everyone will claim that they're terrible at networking. Uh, e even extroverts will claim that. Uh, it, it, a lot of people don't know that any excuse will do in terms of contacting people. Yes. And you can just put it out there. You know, I'm, I'm calling you because our last names begin with the same letter. <laughs> I like that you said that because it's similar to in an in-person networking event, just saying, hi, my name is Nancy, and I noticed you blah, blah, or uh, giving a genuine compliment. It almost doesn't matter what you say. If the other person isn't friendly, move on. And it's the same with calling or virtual communications or sending a note, sending an email. If the person isn't receptive, next uh, there yeah, are, move on to the next card you've Always. probably and you've probably heard the term ghosting or not replying 
whether right. it's to emails or LinkedIn notes or what have you. And I know for the FENG, you have a you have a culture of responding as opposed to we, the we ghosting thing. You want to say about that? A little plug for the FENG? Yes, yes. Well, number one, if you look people up uh, on our in our membership directory, you know a lot about them before you call them. And in outside of our network, of course, we now have LinkedIn, which I tell people is actually not a networking group. It's the world's largest annotated phone book. <laughs> so if you actually want to, if you reach out to anyone, be sure and look them up so that you have a way of starting the conversation. And what I find within our group is it is filled with genuine people. And they're real people. They're nice people. And it doesn't take much to get the conversation started. Yeah. And I think that feeds into people who are introverts. They just need a way to get started. And you mentioned calling them up. And I'll add that introverts often hate the telephone. Not all. Uh -huh. I don't. I'm fine with it. But uh -huh. most of my clients do not like the telephone, for chit chat at least. So if you're going to make a networking call or even a Zoom, Think mm -hmm. of the key things you want to talk about beforehand. And usually you're not going to pick up the phone because you'll schedule it by email or something like that. But mm -hmm. think about what are the key points and what do you have in common? So it's not just that, you know, what are we going to talk about? Right. Well, it, it doesn't hurt to drop in a little artillery before you storm the beach. <laughs> right. And it so, doesn't have to be painful. <laughs> right. A few email, uh, an email back and forth, just telling people what you're going to talk about. And then a lot of times people will jump right into the conversation. Right. As long as they know what, what you're, who you are, why you're calling. Uh, I used to refer to it as the man from Mars syndrome. If you call up somebody cold, they don't know who you are. They don't know why you're calling. You may as well be the man from Mars. Yeah. So it's important. Yeah. I, 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 I'm intrigued by your co comment that uh, introverts don't like the telephone. And I think, is that because uh, they can be surprised by what the how the conversation is developing. That's an interesting point. It could be because being put on the spot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there could be an element of that, like invading my space with a call. Yeah, mm -hmm. could be something like that. That's one reason. Sure, sure. Okay. And that's why I recommend whether it's for telephone calls or business meetings or job interviews or salary negotiations, mm -hmm. I recommend everybody take an improv class. Terrifying for introverts. Oh, speaking on the spot, whoa, why would you wanna do that? Because our natural muscle at, as introverts is mm -hmm. thinking before we speak, but that's not the way the world works. The world works with, you're in a negotiation, somebody throws out a number, you need to say something back, ah, uh, you need to practice building that muscle. So mm -hmm. I recommend take an improv class. It's online now. It's easy. Not easy. Not wow. easy. Very okay. hard. Very hard. But a great skill to build, especially for senior financial executives. Why not? Yeah. It's a skill. It's a skill set that it's a stretch opportunity. Yeah. You know, pe people don't realize that uh, when problems come up, everyone in the room turns to them. <laughs> They're the oracle of all wisdom. Right. And, and they're modest. Uh, they don't realize that people, people are hanging on their every word because they just figure you know. Right. <laughs> Let's how talk about not, how, how could the CFO not know the answer to that question? They do. Right. Uh, and and uh, you're, you're surprised how much, I think people who are CFOs are surprised how much they influence events. They may not say a lot, but they, if they think, they will say the right thing at the right time. And I'm glad you mentioned, did you say the word modesty? Yes. Modest or modesty, yeah. Right. I have a feeling, just having spoken at your group, and just a, a quick look, and all I can see is faces, wonderful faces, but I get the sense, and Correct me if I'm wrong, but you know what? Can we do a quick show of hands? Would that be okay, Matt? Sure. How many people here through quick show of hands 
think they tend to be mainly modest rather than bragging. Modest. All right, so we won't be calling on you because you you'll have nothing to say. <laughs> yeah, the, the hands went down really quickly. <laughs> <laughs> Matt, that's the that's the best way to get the hands down. We're going to be calling on you. That's back to well, I haven't uh, taken the improv class yet, right? I I shared with Nancy earlier that uh, my one of my favorite uh, lines is if it's true in Texas, if if it's true, it ain't bragging. <laughs> oh, excuse me. So let's talk about bragging. Do you have to brag to promote yourself? Matt, what do you think? Uh, it, you can't keep these things a secret. You have to let people know what it is you do. Uh, but in your own self, I think you have to uh, uh, do it in a way that you're comfortable with. Yes, yes. And a lot of that is through practice. But does that mean you need to name drop? and exaggerate and put people down because you try to self-aggrandize and make them look small? Does it, did you have to do that to promote I, yourself? I don't think you have to do that. I don't think so either. And I know so, I know so, that you could promote yourself by just stating the facts about what you've done mm -hmm. that has made an impact. And you can quantify, Peggy, we were talking offline about the idea of, I've got 5 million this and 500 million that, da, 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 da. you do need those numbers because people remember numbers. Mm -hmm. However, they can just be honest numbers, actual reflections of what you've done, your real accomplishments, put them on your resume, include them in your elevator pitch. And by elevator pitch, I don't mean a rehearsed speech, never, ever, ever. It's just a few bullets to introduce yourself that you change every time you talk to somebody else. But the reason you want to do that as an introvert is thinking about that on the spot when somebody says, so tell me what you do and the spotlight is on and you're on your dream interview, you go, I don't know. I don't know. I can't think of it. But if you figured it out beforehand and you edited it, then you have it and you've rehearsed it, then you have it up your sleeve. Yeah, I think it's important that people, that what I try to tell people about their 90 second announcement is you have to practice it so much that it doesn't sound practice. And it feels like 90 seconds, not 90 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> you, you have to think Both about what you're going to say, and then you just push that button. And it, uh, I, I, I learned this in a, there was a negotiating class I took. And uh, the, one of the ways you can buy time during a negotiation while you're thinking about what you're going to say is focusing on a part of the contract that's under discussion that you truly understand. And you can keep asking questions about it and that gives you time. In much the same way, if you really understand your 90 second announcement, when people ask, you can just give it and then that gives you time to think about what you're gonna say next. You don't even have to think about the words you're using. You just touched upon some of my favorite techniques, Matt. And I, I said to you before, we're so like-minded. And that is, Asking questions and buying time, both of those things. Ah, good. good those good. are your friends as introvert, as an introvert. Those are great techniques for negotiating, for job interviews, for networking. It's just fantastic. They're your best friends as, as an introvert. And you this buy is something time. you can even use when we're back in person. Sorry, when, say again? This is something you can even use when we're back meeting in person. Yes, when we're back it, in person. Your, when you're at the big event, you see somebody standing by themselves, you just come up to them. And if you immediately ask them a question, you have time to think. Yes, and even on an event like today, and I mm -hmm. call it an event because this is what we've got right now. Yeah. You can distinguish yourself by asking a terrific question. And then other people can write to you and say, hey, hey, Lee, wonderful question. What got you to think about that? And hey, um, I understand that you work at such and such. I'm looking at such and such. Let's talk. And then all of a sudden you have a networking link. That's the way it works. Nice. So ask questions, folks, at events like this, webinars and so forth. Yeah. And make the questions open-ended. They're more engaging ah. rather than yes, no questions, which right. if the answer is no, it's just like, this you should know is, is Peggy 101. Peggy, Peggy, my wife, Peggy, <laughs> is a speech pathologist. And one of the things that she's trained me to do 
is not to ask yes or no questions. So uh, uh, when people are networking, uh, w one of the things that comes up is uh, you don't want to ask people if they know about any open jobs because it's a yes or no question. Yes, right. They might say Most no. Most likely it's no, and that's the end of the conversation. Goodbye. So you ask people if they know anybody in, who will understand your background, and maybe you'll give them a couple data points. And everybody knows somebody, and it gets them thinking. I love that. And another thing is, and I'm sure you've covered this, Matt, time and again, but a refresher, always, if you don't know what else to say, ask for advice. It makes the other person feel good. It gets them talking. And you might land some interesting information. And if you build enough rapport, maybe they'll throw in an introduction as well that can be helpful to you. Yeah. A asking good questions is, is key. And they don't have to be brand new questions. Yes. Uh, you know, the, the story, you, you may remember the time when cars all had hubcaps, right? So <laughs> you, 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 if you were poor, like I was when I was growing up, you could have different hubcaps on each side of the car because nobody could stand on both sides of the car at the same time. <laughs> so in much the same way, if you have boilerplate questions, you can ask the same questions of other people because they're not going to know you asked that of someone else. Yeah, it's a little like a cover letter. You mm -hmm. can you can say you can repurpose your cover letter as long as it's targeted. Always. Sure, why not? Yeah, and and you can uh, have enough variations in it that it looks original. Yeah. But back to to meeting people and uh, uh, we we talk we were going to talk about camera shyness and how to deal with that now that we're on Zoom. Uh. Matt, can I ask a question first? Would you go, Nancy, would you talk about the difference that you mentioned bragging to, and then marketing? Could you explain the difference between bragging and really stating your accomplishments and letting people know you're unique? Because I think people confuse that. Could you explain that? I see bragging, and thank you for asking that, Peggy. I see bragging as inflating. Inflating, self-aggrandizing, putting other people down, it's just icky. Uh, and I see self-promotion is a necessary means to an end. To be successful in today's economy, and well, as far as long as I've lived, it's, it's, an, it's a necessary thing to manage your career, full stop. It doesn't ever mean you have to puff yourself up. And another aspect of promoting yourself is also asking other people to help promote you and offering to return the favor. So you don't have to do all the heavy lifting. Nice, Thank you. nice. So we certainly wanna talk, since we're all doing these Zoom meetings and you know, yes. maybe there's a half a dozen to a dozen people, uh, I think in a public meeting, maybe it's even easier to interrupt, but on Zoom, what, what are your suggestions? Why don't we try? Okay. <laughs> How about, how about you and Peggy chit chat and I'll, I'll chime in. Oh, I don't know. I don't do no? with those, but uh, okay. the, the, maybe Peggy just... can interrupt us. Okay. Peggy can interrupt us. Okay. I can interrupt you. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so Peggy just did interrupt us. It, right. it, uh, uh, I think, uh, w w what would you say? People, people should uh, be thinking about their questions and perhaps write them down and then yes. wait for a pause in the conversation. Yes, and sometimes the pause never comes, especially in rooms full or Zooms full of oh. extroverts. <laughs> so I like to reframe the idea of interrupting as interjecting, especially for introverts. Okay. And some extroverts I know don't view interrupting as a bad thing. They, they view it more as they're so excited about what you're saying or about what they wanna contribute that they're just getting involved. And so thinking about it as an introvert, you might think, I don't like it when people talk when I talk. Well, I feel the same way. Hmm. However, it's remembering that in a group situation that it's often necessary to get to wedge in. So yes. one technique 
is to say the moderator's name. Hey, Matt, I'd like to add that. Just something simple like that. It's again, you don't have to be perfect with the words. It's just diving in there, but often with a smile and an upbeat tone, as opposed to kind of like being mad that you can't get a word in edgewise, which, mm -hmm. which obviously you wouldn't do. All right. We're, uh, we're in a good time where uh, on Zoom, you can interrupt. Uh, on telephone calls, uh, they went from analog to digital many years ago. And if someone is a type of talker who never pauses, oh. you could scream into the phone. I'm sure you've experienced it. You could scream into the phone. You couldn't interrupt them. Yes. The advanced technique is when you're the moderator, you can hit mute. <laughs> 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 so I'm not, you're, you're, not suggesting you do it all the time. It's only if you so really have somebody Lucy, over Lucy the asked a very good question, Peggy. You want to read it? Yeah, please. Yes, I was just doing that. I think, I think that's excellent. an excellent question. Excellent question. I, have, I would share with you that, that I have the same issue. I can either, uh, when I was going to college, I sat in the front row and I didn't take a whole lot of notes because I could either listen and absorb or I could take notes. I couldn't do both. Right. So I'm intrigued by the question, Peggy. Yeah, her, her question is that she finds that listening and thinking of a question um, are, are, are difficult to do both at the same time, that she finds that thinking of the question is actually distracting her from listening. Um, what, what are your comments on that? It's a good point. As an introvert, you probably are not great at multitasking. You tend to do one thing at a time. And some studies show that none of us really can multitask anyhow. The, the workaround or one workaround I know of is being as prepared as possible for any meeting or presentation like today. And you read the blurb and you say, okay, what's this about? I'm gonna go ready with a few questions. And this way you're at least you're at least involved from the start. And then the other thing is you can send questions afterwards, that kind of thing, and do the recap that we talked about after a meeting, let's say. So those are some workarounds, but yeah, the act of listening and thinking of a question, you're right, that's tough. And in fact, often it's said that you can't actively listen while you're thinking of the next thing you wanna say, because then you're not really being present with the other party. So yeah, yeah. There, there's some of that going on. Right, and, you know, and there's, there's a lot of that. When, when I've had my meetings, I try to go around the room and let everybody do their 90 second announcement. And uh, what you find to a degree is that people aren't listening to anybody who's speaking because they're so nervous about doing their own 90 second announcement. That's true. And, and Ken wanted to add, and I think this is an excellent point, Ken, that once he has a question in his mind, he keeps thinking about it and it's harder to listen or interject, which I agree, which is why I said sometimes it's easier for when I see putting, when there's questions that pop up and I'm mo moderating it, I think it's easier for me to ask it because then I know that person goes, oh, my question's answered <laughs> and now I can relax. Yes. Uh, so that, you, you, would you like to comment on that? Sure. One idea is to write down the question, even for yourself on a notebook or post it or so, wherever you want to write it down. But just so that you're parking it somewhere, you could be more present and then you look for a place to jump in. If it's an online environment, you could put it in the chat like now, or you could write a direct note to the host if that's possible. So there, there are ways to get that done. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with you, Nancy. I think the uh, I, I have this happen to me all the time. Uh, uh, if I get an idea, I really have to write it down immediately or it will just blow out of my mind because, uh, <laughs> you know, Peggy and I are having a conversation. You know, we, we work together on a lot of things these days. So as she's talking, I get an idea. And if I don't say it right away, I'll forget it. Yeah. And I also, I guess I would like to add that it's not just this isn't, I don't think, just an introvert, extrovert. I think it's a learning style. Uh, when you think about the different ways people learn and process information, I'm gonna come to you with my educator hat on. Uh, and extroverts can also listen and process information differently, which yes. means that it's hard to either, they could have a, an extrovert can just as easily have a, a auditory processing difficulties 
uh, as an introvert. It's those two things are not related. So I think that's important for people to realize that they have a lot of different ways of learning and ways of processing information. And the most important thing is for them to figure out what, what it is so that they can respond. If it's the introvert or extrovert problem, or is it some other thing, but then they can be more present in the moment, as you said. Yes. And I've learned this from my years of teaching at NYU, that saying is not teaching. Saying is not communicating. The only way I could, I could give direct instructions that are now students A, B, C, D, and I have no idea what they heard. Some heard E, I swear. So the only way you can be sure, and this applies to job interviews, negotiations, networking, the only way you can be sure somebody heard you is if they play it back. So it's so, you know, so what's your understanding and getting the other person to say it back, really, then you know. Active listening. Active listening. Yeah. And somebody just, there was another question in the chat room that I want to read a couple more. One said, um, what do you do when there's a loud person that speaks all the time and dominates the meeting? And another one that kind of piggybacks is, and uh, if this person, somebody's speaking and they won't stop talking so that, uh, or the speaker won't listen to what you're saying and they kind of disregard you. Those were all related. So I thought I would give them to you. So I, I, I'm gathering, Nancy, that as an introvert, you would not recommend telling someone to shut up. <laughs> shut up. No, <laughs> usually not. No, oh, okay. usually not. Wouldn't unless they really. It, it, then I, I put on my bouncer hat <laughs> or, or you usually if it's the likes of Zoom, you have somebody lined up to take care of them. If you know what I mean, to, right. you know, usher A them Zoom, out the door. That's a nice job. Uh, a zoom bouncer <laughs> a zoom bouncer and and it is an important thing to have when you are hosting let's say if it's a bigger group that you do have a, a wing person who can take care of stuff like that so if you're in charge you don't have to do stuff like that that's not it's, it's a distraction of your energy and it's not good for your audience so the non-stop talker my favorite yeah. technique is preventative and that's having ground rules up up front and it's, a, and it's having an agenda. So if you have an agenda and everybody has their piece of the pie and Matt, you stick to time, I do too. So if you know this person gets five minutes, this person gets 10 minutes and so on, you're also being really inclusive, then the chance of a nonstop talker, you just say, sorry, we're out of time. Now we have to go to the next person. Done. Oh, okay. Yeah, but let's part say- of this, Part of this conversation we're having is that as an introvert, you may be leading meetings. Yes, yes. And learning how to be polite, you know, maybe you're hesitant to tell somebody to shut up. Uh, <laughs> you're responsible for the meeting. I think that's a great suggestion, just saying at the beginning, I like that. that and you uh, wanna- oh, Everyone will get five minutes. Yes, and, and you wanna take that role as moderator as much as possible. It's good for your career visibility, whether you're the head of the team or you're the head of the organization or whatever, but getting that visibility is good for you. And it gets, gets you practice with public, public speaking. And by the way, if you're afraid of public speaking, but, and by that, I mean virtual video or in person, since yeah. that will come back, um, reframe that fear. And studies have shown to remember to reframe that fear into excitement. So to say to yourself, I'm excited to tackle this rather than I'm afraid or calm down or something. It really helps. It helps you with getting in a, in a grounded place. You know, one, one of the things I, I, I say all the time is the, the more you do something, the better you get at it. Yes. Right. Practice makes perfect. And you, and sometimes at the beginning, you have to force yourself to do it. Yes. And remember, but you're not alone. And a, and a lot of these things we're talking about, remember you're not alone. You're not alone if you have a fear of public speaking or if you're looking for a job during a COVID and it's like, oh my gosh, wow. It, you're not alone. There are a lot of people out there. And if you're an introvert and you're thinking, how do I get career visibility? You are not alone and help is available. Yeah, it's, um, I think Zoom is a great thing. Maybe, maybe we can talk a little bit about uh, the, the difference between Zoom and, and telephone calls. 
because we <laughs> you brought it up a little bit at the beginning. Uh, as an introvert, uh, and you know, people might think I'm very extroverted, and I suppose I do at this point get some energy from talking to people. Uh, that's been very helpful to me. But I have found that uh, re uh, since I have a, just a very slight hearing loss, telephone calls leave me a little cold. Um. And what I've been doing is I've only been scheduling Zoom because number one, I can turn the volume up. Sure. That is really helpful. Uh, but more importantly, I pick up cues from people. And I think as in, you, maybe you can comment on this. I think people might be very hesitant to be on camera as an introvert, but don't you pick up more cues that way? I think so, yes. And there is the camera shyness. I mean, I'm a bit camera no. shy myself. It's not a natural inclination for me to go on camera, but in the past year, I've been doing it nonstop, like two webinars today alone, five mm. since yesterday. So, <laughs> so you kind of do get used to it, Matt, to your point, yeah. uh, yes. but. There's, there are some other advantages of Zoom I've found since I'm an instructor at NYU. And that is when I do PowerPoint presentations, which I know we specifically didn't want to do today, but no. uh, the beauty of that is you can do the closed captioning live. And that helps people who are hard of hearing because they could see the words as you're speaking. And it also helps people who aren't fluent in your language so that they could see it in front of them like a, like a foreign movie with the subtitles. So there, wow. there's some real benefits to that. And yes, getting the nonverbal cues, is the person smiling? Are they just watching another video? <laughs> are they, what are they doing? You really get Checking that their connection. Phone. Let me see, I got a, a very important text message. Yeah. As an introvert, I don't like to interrupt, but may I ask a, a question on that, the smiling? Because you've commented on that twice. Um, see, I'm. I find, and I, I've heard that advice before, but I struggle a little bit with, with smiling. I'm a low key reserved person. So I want to kind of increase the energy level a little bit, but I find smiling to be hard to do. And uh, that's just to get a little bit the way I am. Uh, my wife likes to joke, or maybe it's not joke to point out the one wedding picture that she says I didn't mess up. Um, you know, cause I'm not a good, I'm not good at smiling, right? You know, to make, to make it look happy. You have any other suggestions maybe to liven it up or to uh, try to make yourself more approachable? Cause I think that's what the idea with the smile is. And maybe you just touched on some to use a little body movement and hands and things, but you, know, you have any other suggestions? Cause again, sure. I find that challenging. It's, How it about... almost strikes me as a little ritual to do. No, I think, I think you bring up a very good point. Yeah. Uh, I, I said earlier, my wife has heard more life stories than anyone in the entire world because when people turn to her, she has this smile that says, tell me your life story. Uh, so, you know, it, it works. And I think uh, Nancy will can comment on this. It, it, it's uh, a human thing that if you're smiling, you appear to be more receptive. Yeah, definitely. But if, it's, if it doesn't come so naturally, then you look like you're grimacing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so oh, good. You got you a yeah. smile. Yeah, you're that's smiling. What my wife says about our wedding picture. She says, You look like you're in pain. I said, Well, you kept on telling me for three hours to smile. <laughs> We're still well, married 20, 24 yeah. years later, but <laughs> I would say practice. Uh, you, you can only, as Matt said, you can only become comfortable with something that's just uncomfortable through practice. It's not going to just, nobody's going to wiggle their fingers. Nancy can't make you. <laughs> feel good about it. but if you stand in front of a mirror and practice or even with your wife while you're having a conversation uh practice smiling and maybe have her give you a nonverbal cue like if you're not smiling just thumbs down while you're talking but if you're smiling uncomfortably and it's a painful also thumbs down so that you'll start yeah. to get that feedback yourself of oh I could just kind of look with a smile and and she's not doing anything so I don't know. Do you have another um, yes. suggestion? I have a few. I have a few. Jump I'll, right I'll be, in, Nancy. Okay. <laughs> Number one, when you smiled, I will share. Can I call you Jonathan? Yeah, yeah. Definitely. You lit up the room. It changed the whole dynamic when you did. But don't believe me. I recommend you record yourself doing your elevator pitch with some smiles and one with no smiles. And Teach yourself, decide what you want to, how you want to be seen to the outside world. But the, here's another one. Tip number two, posture. Look at yourself right now. Yeah. 
Yes. What would you adjust to show you're really present and with us? And how about like fully straight up, like book on your head straight and even yeah. leaning forward a little bit? Okay. Okay. I think I need a new tool for that. My chair, and I've thought about that for kind of encourages going back. Encourages, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's a very comfortable chair, but it's back, uh, it's back right? So maybe I need to so tinker with that. Back. Tinker with that. And another thing you did well, though, is I threw you threw in some hand gestures because your shot is a little further back. It looked really good. I mm -hmm. thought it enhanced what you were doing. If it were a tight shot, you couldn't. It's hard. Yeah. But in your your shot is a little further back. It worked. So yeah. there's some things you could do like that. One okay. of the pe stories Peggy tells all the time is about Bill Clinton. And anyone who's actually met him knows that when you're talking to Bill Clinton, there is no one else in the room as far as yes. he's concerned. And I, I took that lesson. And it's very important to be in the moment with people. That, that is, is a big help as an introvert to building your relationships. Wouldn't you agree? Yes. And I have a fun story about my meeting with Bill Clinton in my book. Uh, we don't have time for it. But one other technique is your voice. What can you do, Jonathan, and everyone out there to engage people with your voice? By, by using warmth, by throwing in pauses, by using variety in your voice, because when we get nervous, we tend to go into a monotone. And I know Peggy has a zillion tips on this as well as a speech pathologist, but I'll leave it at that in the interest of time. No, no, that makes and, and also asking good, learning to ask questions. Yeah. Yes. So people, while yes. someone's talking, to think of yet another question. As, as the joke goes, enough about you. Let me tell you about me. <laughs> right, and and if for those of you who have trouble asking questions, think about when you were back in school and they talked about the WH question. So think, uh, just forget the question. Is there a what you want to know, or who you want to know, or why you want to know, just one of those things. And that will pop into your head very quickly because we, we tend to think that once I say, well, what? Well, what do you want to know? What should I do when I'm talking and I should smile? You know, uh, how should I sit? <laughs> what should I do with my hands? All of that's very easy. And all this stuff counts. As a senior financial person, you might be very much focused on numbers and, and keeping the organization safe and all these important concrete analytical things. But you need to remember your self-presentation is so important in terms of your career visibility and continued meteoric success in your, in your career. Yeah, no, it's very, it's very important. Uh, for, for you to be able to present yourself uh, appropriately. Uh, and what I found, uh, and we can go back to the very beginning of our conversation about Myers-Briggs, there is no impediment to success being an introvert. No, we all have strengths and weaknesses, sure. We, we have to accept who we are and how we do things and uh, learn to adapt to the world around us as long as we understand who we are. Right, I have another question. Okay. Uh, Lucy, has a, uh, Lucy has another question. Back in the days of live meetings, she said she would find that her comments and ideas were often attributed to someone else. I always attributed it to my cloak of invisibility, uh, but can you suggest how to deal with that? And I'm just gonna add, do you think that's, Nancy, do you think that's introvert or do you think that's women in a meeting with a lot of men? I'll leave that to you to answer. That could be introvert. That could be women in a meeting with a lot of men. That's certain cultures. There's all kinds of reasons for that. Yes. And that's another reason you want to get the role of moderator as much as possible. So you get to control the spigot. You want to be on that agenda as much as possible. You want to practice developing your voice again with the things we talked about, vocal variety, pauses. You want to be assertive when somebody cuts you off. Excuse me, I'd like to finish. You want to be assertive about jumping in when you have something to say. And we could go on, but I know we have five minutes left. <laughs> You froze for a second. I froze. I think I just yeah. smiled. Uh, at least on my screen, but keep going. <laughs> okay. We've had issues with our internet here. Sadly, oh, we all we have, have issues. Again, yeah, so yeah. I don't know. Yeah, okay. 
the people were here from cable earlier. So oh. I guess they didn't fix it. Oh, well. There are no more. Oh, so keep going. We're, um, Does anyone have more questions that they'd like to ask? These have been terrific questions. Oh, Thank here's you another both. one. It says, any suggestion on rule of thumb for amount of direct eye contact <laughs> so it doesn't seem yes. <clears throat> like you're staring at somebody? And if you have tips for introverts, for yes. kids in class and school, somebody asked that one. Okay, so the, the rule of thumb for direct eye contact on Zoom, as long as you're speaking, look at the, look into the webcam or the video cam and not the nostril shot not the looking down straight on the the video cam is the eyeball those are the eyes of the people you are looking to full stop looking at full stop and then when you're not talking give your eyes a rest and you look at the people around but otherwise you're looking at the video cam and everyone else peripherally in person yeah, you don't want to be staring at anyone, of course. And there are cultural reasons around that too. And in some cultures, people looking at somebody directly is considered aggressive and there are all kinds of things like that. So it's when in Rome is the quick answer to that question. And it's also maybe asking for feedback, but I'd say a few seconds and then look away, a few more seconds, look away. And if you're uncomfortable to make direct eye contact, this is in person for any reason, cultural, gender, all that stuff, then look at eyebrows or ears or nose for the same exact effect. Almost nobody can tell. Oh, okay. Uh, and do you recommend question, that people, uh, yeah. you know, we're, we're back to this smiling thing. Uh, I, I think uh, Zoom is very powerful in terms of you knowing that you're not smiling. You should be watching yourself a bit. I used to recommend the, the mirror thing on phone calls. Uh, People can tell whether you're smiling even on a phone call. Yes. So, yes. How, how do you feel about watching yourself on Zoom? Do you, I, as an introvert, is it disconcerting? I get used to it. I, as long as I'm super early in prep and see that there's no fly on my forehead kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Okay. I guess the fly could arrive, but. Yeah. Yeah, I get used to it. I didn't love it at first, but I get used to it. Do you find it distracting? Um, well, I'm looking at the camera more than myself. I'm looking oh, at the camera. Okay. So no, not really. Yeah, get used to it. So and we're kind the, of wrapping up. Is there anything that I missed or, or that we missed in, in our discussion? There was that one kid's question and I'm a career ah. coach. So I deal mainly with adults, but the quick, the, a lot of the stuff we talked about, I believe would apply to kids as well about about visibility and speaking up and being prepared with your remarks because you could be terrified to speak up in class. I agree with you and as an educator who pivoted from working with kids to working with adults I don't think that a lot of the things we're saying are any different uh, as far as how to be a, an effective communicator. I think uh, we should also talk about the fact that uh, people are having back-to-back -back Zoom meetings now. It's exhausting, yeah. Right, exhausting. So For I everyone. think uh, to the degree you can do it, what would you recommend? I, I, I would assume you would recommend that we, we schedule breaks between the meetings. As much as possible, yeah. Right? Yeah. Kind of, or, or maybe turn your camera off for some meetings so that you have an opportunity to recharge your, your batteries. Yes, it was so important for all of us, especially introverts, to have that recharge your battery time, whether it's taking a walk or a jog or, or a meditation or, or listening to music, what have you, but finding that downtime, we all need it. And especially yeah. with all the stress of, of the COVID right now. Yeah, well, there's a lot of stress for everybody. Uh, of course, we also recommend that they buy your book that this will oh, be a good you. start, right? Thank you. Yeah. You and right a good to me. start on understanding yeah. the concepts uh, and, and issues that are related to being an introvert. Yes. And let your quiet star twinkle. Yeah. It, it, there, there's nothing wrong with being an introvert. It's okay. It's great. And, and it, again, I, I think you'd agree. It, does, it has no impact on your success as long as you understand who you are. And, and this book will give you some great tools for uh, addressing what you feel might be issues, right? Yes, 
And thank but, you. Is there so another much. question, Peggy? Because we have. We no, people are just saying thank you. They have to jump off. That you were wonderful and great and helpful, and I will second that. It was great having yeah, you. This was, a, this was a great conversation, and it was I, I want to thank Nancy for joining us. Uh, my meetings not only start on time; I try to end them on time out of respect for people who have other things scheduled. So, Nancy, thank you, thank you, thank you for joining us pleasure, today. Pleasure, pleasure. Chat with Matt, and hopefully. Uh, uh, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll be able to have you present in person in the not too distant future. I hope so. Thank so, you. Everybody stay well. Uh, remember, go out to our website. If you have a couple extra bucks that you can part with, we can always use donations. We live on voluntary donations uh, to support our organization. So uh, everybody stay well. Uh, that's the most important thing. And uh, good luck in your career. I am always available if anybody needs to speak with me. Of course, we'll need to schedule a Zoom because I don't take very many phone calls anymore. So God bless everybody. Stay well. And we'll see you again on Chat with Matt. I have two more meetings scheduled next week, which I hope you'll join me for. Thank you. And Nancy, again, thank you. With great pleasure to everybody. Well. Your su continued success. Thank, thank you. you.